You know, I just like kind of um, come back, so to speak, from having a quick look uh, on various religious searches here on YouTube. And it hasn't stopped, has it? You know, this perpetual religious argumentation that goes on within certain aspects of Christianity, the New Age movement, and all the rest of them, it, it just hasn't come to like an end. It's almost like people want to expend tons of energy um, protecting themselves and the people that they associate with or somehow feel somehow connected to uh, more than wanting to find out about life or about nature or the way the world works. Um, and the debate kind of like gets more and more complex because new dimensions are added to it by every single individual new perspectives are added to it by every single individual uh, and do they actually manage to achieve anything to which uh, you know the, the bottom line is there is a noticeable change or progression in style, genre, and rhetoric with reference to, let's say, Wicca over time. Um, but, so what? You know, so what? Is, is it like, if there wasn't the progression of the rhetoric of, let's say, Wicca or Christianity over a period of time, that the individuals who are practitioners of those faiths would not actually have any maturity at all. Is, is, is that really the case? Can, can that really be the case? That you've got to have the intellectual progression of the um, broadcast genre rather than having people who can think. Uh, and weigh up the pros and cons and assess things intelligently. I mean, maybe that's actually the case. Maybe it is actually the case for individuals to get not only their self-reflection but also their programming uh, anew each and every single time that they listen to a broadcast from someone who has a particular title or classification. I mean, I mean, all I can do is tell you my point of view and what, what, I, what I think is important. Um, and that's that whatever this magic thing is, it was much more important than whatever the Wiccan religion was. Uh, because if there is a promise, which there is, okay, in certain forms of religious schools of thought, that the natural world can be somehow manipulated for the purposes of curing diseases, uh, communicating over distance, rearranging uh, things which exist in the physical world to your advantage, this has obviously got to be something which needs to be studied. However, uh, within these Wiccan circles, if for example, I mean obviously the same thing could be applied to certain forms of Christianity and of course the power of prayer, um, without the shadow of a doubt, okay, it means that the same kind of issue. I mean, within these Wiccan circles, a lot of the broadcasts are about morality. They're about different interpretations as to what ritual tools and accessories are about. Um, and they're about, essentially, mythology. Which is curious, really. Because... You know, these are people who, sorry, let me rephrase that. 
There are individuals who come under this category and speak very passionately on the subject of magic. And who suggest that this thing, whatever it is, is so powerful that only a few people should get involved in it, which of course they happen to be one of them. Which is of course interesting in its own right. But yet this thing called magic can move furniture about the room. This thing called magic can heal diseases, transform people's mentality at a distance, uh, invade people's personal spaces and observe them under various peculiar conditions. This sounds like a very important uh, medical technology, spy technology, political technology, social technology, and wouldn't it be wonderful if you had to do a house move to be able to wave your magic wand and get the furniture to move all by itself and at no cost? Right. So whatever this magic thing is, it requires much more in the way of study, and it is therefore, one could argue, superior in importance to the issues surrounding whether your pentagram is made out of wood or made out of stone, or whether one particular deity concept is superior to another, and in what sense. But remember, these are also people who go back to Alistair Crowley's definition of the word magic. Now if you think about the organization of the section of uh, magic and theory and practice in which Alistair Crowley talks about the word magic. During his initial description, he says that magic could be the publishing of a book. It could be a chemical experiment to, to create chloride of gold. Physical world things. Normal physical world things. But then, there's the idea of the magic of tradition, which is unempirical. And I've, of course, spoken about this before. Why is it, and this, this just goes around and around my head all the time, why is it that there are individuals within the New Age the occult and the pagan world who are intellectually incapable of looking at what Aleister Crowley was trying to say when he created his definition of magic? Now, for the most part, when I'm talking about magic as some kind of supernaturalist practice, I try to err on the side of this magic of tradition, the unempirical, experiential, experimental art form, because I think that that is important. It says something about us, because we have somehow the ability to have certain strange experiences, but we don't know enough to be able to say what they mean about the world. But isn't there a whole world of difference between something which is unempirical and therefore outside of the normal methodologies of the physical sciences and the creation of chloride of gold in a laboratory under laboratory conditions and observation, or indeed the process of printing a book and getting it out there to the public. So, Alistair Crowley was just trying to convince people that it's a good idea to be scientific and artistic about everything they do in life. And he uses analogies from the magic of tradition to explain 
the attitude you need to try and be successful, such as dedication being important, such as trying to be meticulous, trying to be precise, which no one is perfect at. Okay. I mean, this idea of being meticulous is what he was talking about when he referred to the fact that the magician is always within the circle every single day of his life. Because in, when you're doing your ritual in the circle, you try and do it meticulously and precisely in terms of your concentration, your meditation, uh, and the various different orders of, of service during the actual ceremony. So, it appears, therefore, that the subject of magic has within it a number of different genres. Okay? You got the word magic applied to trying to be efficient and effective in life, trying to be scientific in your thinking, creative in your improvement of skill. using creativity to try and better understand the things that you experience in life and that's everything from I don't know how to make a cake through how to build a relationship through how to get a job how to deal with people growing up All right. then of course you've got your personal unempirical experimental dealing with apparently supernatural things And then you've got the symbolism, so to speak, of doing ceremonial magic by way of analogy to another aspect of life learning. And you still see these people, okay, who are still doing it, okay, still using the phrase Magic is the art and science of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. And applying it to the unempirical. Which demonstrates, does it not, that these are individuals who don't seem to be able to intellectualize about the subject that they're talking about and are there, therefore and thus presenting themselves to the world on a publicly accessible platform on what is it the world's second most pow powerful or large search engine being YouTube as being people who can't think and are not good sources of information. But people tend to follow the images and ideas and words which resonate with them, don't they? You've got the silly billies who follow Pat Condell. And the fact that they resonate well with the words and ideas of Pat Condell, for instance. And on the diametrical opposite side, Richard Coughlin. And the people who are attracted to his way of being. Because there's politics in thought, okay? There's politics in thinking. And the people that you are attracted to, the ideas you are attracted to, says something about your intellectual development about certain subjects and issues. And trying to get this straight, okay, can be difficult for a lot of people. I think this could be a reason why some types of religious people find it difficult to progress intellectually. Because instead of worshipping their god, they worship their pundit. Okay, the individual who has been promoting this, that and the other, or this, that and the other idea. 
um, which they resonated well with and felt somehow saved or relieved by or healed by as a result of listening to uh, to that particular person which is of course symptomatic so it seems of a desire to freeze in one's growth to stop in personal change and to not advance to a level whereby they can start to see life from different directions and different points of view. It's unhealthy. Inhuman. It's not good for you. Which kind of like, uh, I suppose, makes me sad. Alright. we are an evolved species and we've got the capacity to develop beyond the, um, the limitations that we have right now okay and we can do that through being plastic malleable flexible rather than just defiantly holding up one particular icon and shielding yourself behind that icon okay be it an individual be it someone who's got some ideas which you apparently resonate well with being on YouTube uh, I personally have found quite healing for myself because I've had the, the opportunity uh, to express the kind of ideas that I'm giving you right now. Whereas when I was very closely involved with the pagan movement a certain number of years ago when I was younger and the Wiccan pagan movement was much more evangelical despite the fact that they would of course disagree with the use of that particular phrase but never mind it was evangelical. I've been able to express here on YouTube what I really thought. And I've also been able to do a bit of growing myself. I'm certainly not going to deny that I've changed. But the, 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 the core thinking about this particular subject is still the same okay strange experiences happen under some strange circumstances and it's important to remember that okay but, but all we can say is that they're strange experiences what is the point and the value in extrapolating towards religious belief which you, you can do until the cows come home. I mean, what, what, what merit or virtue does that have? Okay, so you have a strange experience which appears to be seeing a ghost. Where is the intellectual leap from there to life after death? What is the connecting thing? What is the missing link in that discussion? It isn't there because it's missing. All you know is you've had a strange experience, that's all. If you want to be a believer, fine. But you can't say that the experience of seeing a ghost is proof that there are consciousnesses outside of the body. You can hypothesize these things, and if you want it to be your religion, then fine. But why on earth defend your religion? What is more important? Trying to understand the strange experiences or promoting a new faith which you've suddenly invented. Which one has more value? Huh? What is most important? Cuddling an idea like a soft toy or nature and people. 
That's right, nature. Human nature. The way that we think, the way that we are, how an altered state of consciousness affects us, which particular varieties of altered states of consciousness there are, from the fastest to the slowest brainwave activity, and how different emotions during those forms of meditation would have the effect of, of what upon the brain and upon the body. It's fascinating stuff. But if you ask one of these religious people about it, what will they be able to tell you? Nothing. Apart from the fact that they believe. They believe. If you want to have a belief, do it. I think it's much healthier to have a religion than not to have a religion. I, I, I'm not telling you that atheists are evil. I don't think they are. And having a faith can be good for you. But what is the point in spreading it over the internet and, uh, and protecting it so much? As opposed to finding out about people and life. How our brains work. How our bodies work. How the two interconnect. And trying the best you can to be scientific about these things. Now, I could ramble on an awful lot longer than this. What I'd love to do is just uh, one of these talking videos in which I'm just talking consistently for a period of like two hours. That would be cool. But of course, I've got to have two hours to spare. In the meantime, I'll bid you good fortune. God bless. Look after yourself, no matter what religion you are or not, as the case may be. I know that some atheists listen to my ramblings. Don't worry, you know, I'm not against you. And let's try and be a little more practical and stop all these religious arguments because they, they don't help us, they divide us. The thing which holds us all together is the fact that we're all humans. Primitive apes who, which uh, came out of Africa, all of us. Every single person is a black man, especially the white men, because we all came from Africa. God bless.